So you're in for a real treat this evening. I am blessed to be able to welcome Brett Weinstein to Virtual Futures. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of Virtual Futures. And for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim, hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets and the techno parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, I'm joined by evolutionary biologist Brett Weinstein. He has spent over two decades exploring human nature through attempting to understand the interplay between culture and evolution. Many in this audience might know him from the US controversy at the Evergreen State College, but the media attention around this event has only helped to highlight a more universal issue. In other words, the rifts that are forming between the hard sciences and politics. Given this backdrop, Brett joins us uh, this pressing moment to share his roadmap for how we might ensure a future for humanity. One that will acknowledge our addiction to growth, challenge the political status quo, and ultimately allow us to avoid self-destruction. So to show us how our ability to imagine futures might be the one evolutionary gift that saves us from total annihilation, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Brett Weinstein to the Virtual Futures stage. So Brett, it might be an obvious question, but it's a question that's not asked enough, and it's, it's very simple really. What is so special about human beings? Ah, that is an excellent question. So on the one hand, human beings are very much uh, a product of evolution and each of evolution's products is special in its own right, but we also have uh, a particularly special version of special, which involves the offloading of a much larger percentage of our behavioral repertoire to the cultural layer. And that interplay between our genomes, which are in many ways quite standard, and our cultural layer, which is not matched by any other creature on Earth, that interplay is one that has to be dealt with very carefully uh, as you're thinking evolutionarily, but it is really the key to our being able to do what no other creature on Earth has ever been able to do. So you've, you've been known as saying that genes build brains and culture finds tune if fine tunes those brains could, could you tell us a little bit more about how culture and and genes or how culture serves our genomes sure but the first thing to realize is that we uh we are physiologically modified and heavily so to be able to have these brains which are largely not programmed at birth now of course they're not perfectly blank slates at all. I don't want to fall into that trap, but they are the blankest slates of any that have ever existed in any creature. And so why would our genomes have built brains that were capable of having what amounts to software loaded on after we are born at a much higher rate than any other creature? And the answer to that uh, is closely tied with the recognition that human beings are capable of doing a much wider variety of things than any other creature. So if you think about all the things that human beings have discovered how to do, all of the niches that we inhabit from fishing to farming to hunting and gathering and all the variations within those categories, it is only possible to be a species with that diversity of behaviors because the software is uh, auto programming after we are born rather than being a direct product of things written into our genomes. So let's talk about some of that, that 
programming. So there is a relationship between human culture and the human genome, and you call that the, the omega principle. Could you just explain why that is so important? So the idea is that there is a, um, an obligate relationship between our genomes and the cultural layer that they allow us to have. Um, and that relationship involves two parts. The first part is relatively familiar to people who follow Richard Dawkins and the idea of memes, which is that culture is a very rapidly evolving landscape. But the second part is less familiar and in fact hasn't been properly spelled out, which is that there's a hierarchical relationship between our genomes and our culture. Our culture is subordinate to our genomes in terms of the objectives that it has to serve. And that's really um, not a happy thing to communicate because the subjugation of our cultures to our uh, genomes interests actually pits us against each other in a way that is unhealthy under the best of circumstances and downright lethal when you have the kinds of technologies at your disposal that modern humans do. So if we are to survive the 21st century, we're going to have to grapple with the fact that we are culturally innovating mechanisms uh, to, um, to serve our, our genome's interests and that in some sense we have to take our genomes out of the driver's seat. One of those interests that our genomes have is is that of growth, and our seem, it seems to be an innate want to con constantly, as human beings, grow into other environments. And there's three ways in which that happens, aren't there? So there's nothing particularly human about the addiction to growth. Effectively, um, there is a drive to find unexploited opportunities and to exploit them, and that's true for all creatures, but it looks very different if you're uh, a dandelion moving into uh, a valley that doesn't have uh, a direct competitor versus a human being that has more uh, tools at its disposal with which to, to make growth occur. So um, growth can occur in uh, multiple fashions. The first one, the most obvious frontier and Growth and frontier are two concepts that I think should be closely aligned. The first kind of frontier is a literal geographic frontier where the human population can find a landmass that uh, doesn't have human competitors in it or um, uh, is otherwise hospitable to the growth of that population. That population can enter that landscape and it can make use of what opportunities are there and grow to what's called carrying capacity, which is the limit of that habitat to support um, creatures. Second kind of frontier is uh, a technological frontier, where instead of finding a new landmass, one finds a new mechanism for exploiting the same piece of territory and population, and again, grows based on the fact that that piece of territory can support more individuals. And then the third uh, one of these frontiers is actually only a frontier if you view it through the lens of an individual population. And this is a transfer frontier where uh, a population discovers that by robbing another population of whatever it has, that it can increase the well being of the population uh, doing the transferring. And so this is. Um, not a frontier if one thinks across both populations at zero sum, one population loses and the other gains. But if we are pitted against each other in population against population competition, then the discovery that some population can't defend what it has is an opportunity to create growth. And that again is something that we have to fight off, that we are, we are built to seek these things and worse, we are built to rationalize doing it. So uh, one doesn't transfer the wealth from another population by acknowledging that that's what, what you're doing. What we do is we dehumanize the other population in order to justify that transfer. So this is why, at least I think this conversation is super important at this point in time because we've seen this rapid expansion, this rapid growth in the 20th century, but it almost feels like as we approach and, and uh, encroach onto the 21st century, there's a slowing down of that ability to grow. And I wonder if, if we're coming to an end of a particular boom, what that means for us as human beings and our relationships to each other. Yeah, the answer is it's not good news unless we 
wake up to it and decide to do something about it. So we've been doing something novel, something our ancestors really didn't have the opportunity to do, which is to transfer wealth effectively from future inhabitants of the earth. And we have made the present relatively comfortable by robbing uh, people who don't exist yet and therefore can't speak for themselves. But we're also running up against the limit of our ability to do that. Seven and a half billion people is a large number of people to inhabit this planet. And the uh, voracious appetite that we have for consumer goods is basically liquidating the well-being of the planet, the present well-being and the future well-being. And so we're going to have to recognize that that is simply mathematically unstable. And we have to address what's causing it rather than embrace these uh, cornucopian fantasies that we will continue to find our way through bottlenecks by discovering new technologies because some of those technologies will work and others will turn out to have terrible downsides that we will ultimately experience the costs of. Do you think right now we're still at that convincing stage where we're believing that we're going to get through the bottlenecks because of technology? It's going to be okay. The future will save us. So let's not worry in the present. Well, I, I mentioned before the problem of rationalization, and I think in some sense we've got a game theory problem, and I've increasingly come to believe that game theory is the subject that we all really ought to study because most of our problems can be resolved to relatively canonical ones if you can learn to spot the issue. But we have uh, essentially a, a collective action problem whereby those individuals that embrace the idea that we will find technologies to get us through the bottleneck, free themselves from obligation. And those who recognize that we won't get through the bottleneck on our present trajectory add extra obligation to themselves. And so the best deal available is to be a cornucopian and imagine that you don't have obligations because the new technologies always come to save us just in time and let others figure out what we're really going to do about it because then you get the benefits of the solutions without paying the cost of um, of supporting them yourself so in some sense we have to recognize that an individual is rational to pretend that we are in a better situation than we are that individual has the best of both worlds if the world is saved by some new plan and they don't have to invest in building the plan then they'll be able to transition with the rest of us What's the other option? What's the other option? If it's not, uh, if it's not going through, is it essentially tyranny? Well, I have argued that tyranny is the end game of prosperity, and that at the point that the growth frontiers run out, um, we effectively turn on each other, and that is basically the meaning. That's what transfer tr frontiers look like: is populations. Um, uh, challenging each other for access to resources. That tyranny, though, is going to be different this time because the, the number of us is much higher, the interconnectedness of all of the populations of the Earth is much greater, and the technologies at our disposal are much more powerful. And so, in effect, this is the perfect storm whereby those processes where populations uh, become tribal and confront each other is now uh, set up to be lethal to all of us. That we are hooked together in such a way that we just simply can't afford a descent into, um, into tyranny. We, we won't survive it. So um, that's bad. On the other hand, perhaps it sets us up to substitute the jeopardy that we all experience together for the one thing that tends to cause humans to unite with each other, which is um, uh, an enemy that is worth collaborating to fend off. And in this case, the enemy is a little odd. The enemy is us, and we need to, to fend it off together. Um, but if we can spot it for what it is, then we actually are built to put aside our differences and confront the problem uh, together. And if we did that, I'm pretty sure we would find ourselves li living in an incredibly vibrant era, one that was really fascinating to be alive for. And you know, the, the picture that we are often sold is that to confront the problems of the earth is to face massive austerity. And in some sense, I think uh, that's just unlikely to be true. Um, 
And if we, if we understood how interesting it would be to live in an era where we were really confronting the chronic problems of humanity once and for all, uh, we might be really eager to get there. It, it could be quite a thing. Do you think we will have the time to see those chronic problems come over the horizon? Or do you think it'll be something more instantaneous? Do you think we won't evolve ourselves out of this issue? The only option is either self-destruction or annihilation through some sort of existential risk? Well, I'm concerned. Uh, when I was younger, I used to imagine that it was going to take some uh, substantial catastrophe to wake us up. And we've now seen some substantial catastrophes and we haven't woken up. Um, so, you know. S -s Such as? Well, you know, Katrina should have woken Americans up uh, pretty, pretty clearly. Fukushima, uh, I think, should very, uh, it has a very clear message for us about externality and about uh, unintended consequences and about our economic systems. And we don't wake up. And so something else is is a foot that is preventing us from having the natural reaction to these things that we should have. And it has something to do with the um, alterations, I think largely technological alterations, in the way we relate to each other. So I think relatively mundane aspects of our social media environment are actually affecting the way we construct our narrative of what's taking place. They're serving you know, the, the algorithms that are managing who we talk to and what messages get through are in effect constructing a very simple story that isn't right. And that I think it may um, block us from actually having the proper reaction to the present triggered so that we can actually respond coherently to our situation. Do you think that with regards to social media, do you think that's the thing that's defining the tribe? So instead of looking at ourselves as a global tribe, i.e. humanity, social media is a thing that is forcing us in to smaller communities based on whether it's identity politics, which I know you've been involved with, or the nation state. Do you think that that has become the survival mechanism? It's no longer about us collectively as 7 billion, but us individually in our smaller communities. What is the political problem that may arise from that, and how do we avoid uh, avoid sort of doubling down into smaller tribes that will inevitably, as as you've said, end up fighting? Well, it's done a number of things. We're watching the assembly of coalitions that aren't in and of themselves coherent. And so those coalitions actually may be temporarily quite useful in terms of gaining power, but game theory tells us that they'll come apart as soon as they win that power, you know, more or less as they're dividing the spoils, they will, uh, they will faction. So that's not a long-term process, but what, uh, what I think is more troubling than the coalitions is the, um, so, you know, we've all talked about echo chambers, but there's a way in which the economic system that manages the Goliaths that manage our, our social universe, they have perverse incentives. And because they are in competition with each other, they have to figure out how to keep our attention rather than having us move on to some other platform. And that competition for intention, for attention makes them uh, tell us what we want to hear um, rather than what we need to know. And that distinction is a very important one. So they reinforce our biases rather than challenging them. And the question really is, can we, uh, can we bring about a conversation that does tell us what we need to know without the uh, algorithms dicing it up and making it break down? So I'm, I'm hopeful that that's possible, but it's not entirely clear how that can function when virtually all of these conversations are mediated by privately held uh, adaptive algorithms that have very narrow economic interests. So right now, for, forget nuclear war, forget nanotechnology, forget synthetic biology. The real challenge, the real existential risk is Facebook. Well, maybe, or the way I prefer to think of it, we uh, or Twitter, one or the other. 
Um, we face a great many grave threats. And if you view them as independent, then it's uh, quite daunting. If you view them as symptoms of a small number of causes, probably causes that don't have a name yet, then they become tractable because really what you're after is something, you know, not a solution to the problem of nuclear waste building up at reactors that requires vigilance to keep it from uh, escaping into the environment. But if the problem is the way we assess risk in an environment where um, we're using, you know, 18th century tools to manage 21st century problems, then we can address all of these things together without having to understand the details in each one uh, as independent phenomena. So in that case, how do we change our, our view on risk, our approach to risk? Well, there's a short-term question and there's a long-term question. So short term, we who have grown up in an environment that has misinformed us about risk need to um, become curious about how it really works, how things at a scale that doesn't match our daily lives really unfold so that we can get smart about it. In the longer term, we need to take seriously the, uh, the process by which culture uh, and other forms of learning cause minds to, uh, to form. In, in essence, if you, if you think about the way we educate children, we're completely backwards about it. And we don't even think about how odd it is to take children and put them in a room and try to get them all to face forward and then scratch things out on a chalkboard or if we're modern, you know, project them on the wall. When really, you know, learning should be uh, exhilarating and it should involve puzzles that properly show the mind what it can't access directly. In other words, there are certainly uh, games we could invent that would alert children to what a black swan event was, right? How unexpected things can come out of nowhere and upend your expectations built on the average situation. So really we, we should be at this moment thinking, what is the ideal package of games and puzzles and exercises that would keep children uh, focused on things that would cause their minds at the point they reached adulthood to have all of those things on board so that when they faced the questions like the ones we face, those questions would be much more intuitive to them than they are to us. So is that another case of us just relinquishing our responsibility in the present and just hoping that the future will solve it? Nope, we've got to do both. We have to get through the bottleneck, which means that we, who went to school that wasn't all that useful, have to figure out how to keep things going uh, for the next hundred years as we are figuring out how to improve the educational system so that it uh, makes wiser humans to solve the next set of problems. I mean, is it useful to flip the question in some sort of way and just assume that humanity doesn't have a future and then use that as a narrative that forces people into action? Yeah, this is a tough one because uh, in every room, at least every one I've seen so far, there's a dichotomy between people who are motivated by hope and people who are motivated by fear. And neither of these things is wrong, right? You can have a rational conversation in either one of those paradigms. What you can't do is have those conversations together because if you wanna talk about how serious things are, you start robbing people of hope and they become frustrated. And if you wanna to appeal to those who need the hope, then you leave those who are motivated by fear with the sense that you're not being realistic. So anyway, I don't know how we divide those two conversations or train ourselves to be able to tolerate the sort of breadth. But um, it would be great if we could get past that because I, I have the sense that this might be one of the things that makes the problem um, very difficult to solve is the sort of dual uh, irreconcilable obligations that come along with the conversation. So on that note, who here is motivated by hope about the future? All right. And then who is fearful? 
interesting that that uh, hope outnumbers fear in this room, especially in this audience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Have you been to virtual futures before? Uh, the other way round. Um, so, in that case, if we're stuck between these two potential ways to generate narratives, you, you've said that the one way or the one evolutionary gift we have, which allows us to kind of um, escape. Uh, self-destruction is the ability to describe and think about alternative futures. How do we, both on the hope side and the fear side, come together to create the same sorts of narratives? Or do you think we're being fed those already? Do you think certain agendas about the future are being fed down to us in a way to keep a population very subdued about the potential crisis that may or may not be on the horizon? Uh, I certainly think there's some of that. I, I don't think we know how much, but there are certain narratives that serve certain constituencies. There is the unfortunate fact in some ways that we are so well taken care of uh, in the first world with respect to basic needs that the things that should trigger us to worry, just we're not getting those signals. And so there, this really does come down to a black swan problem where the thing comes out of nowhere and by the time it does, you, there's nothing to do about it. Uh, so we have to anticipate that and take it uh, seriously. But I also think we are strangely being robbed of some of our best tools for navigating difficult subjects. So I think this is less true uh, on this side of the pond, but in the US, comedy has become almost impossible, right? And this is, you know, the comics themselves tell us that they, you know, they don't go to colleges anymore, it's not worth it. Um, and, you know, people are constantly, you know, policing them morally on Twitter and elsewhere. And the problem is that comedy is maybe the key mechanism whereby we, we play with concepts that are uncomfortable at the edge of consciousness. And so our comics are very important. And to the extent that our comics are either sidelined or have been co-opted into some game where they're looking for applause rather than laughs, we, we can't discover that actually we all do know that something is a bit wrong and we disagree a little bit over what exactly it is, but that it's, you know, it's something we have to confront. So anyway, I would say um, we need to give our comics leeway if we're to navigate this and we're doing exactly the opposite you don't think humor evolved for that particular purpose though do you oh i kind of do yeah um yeah humor is clearly about um discovering things on the fringe of consciousness and the things on the fringe can be of many different types so it's not, you know, it's not necessarily for existential threats, but it certainly is for things that are hard to navigate uh, just by, you know, analysis. So from, I mean, it's, it's great to have conversations like this, but from an everyday level, how do we, how do we walk that tightrope between just survival and thrival? So as you're walking down the street worrying about paying your tax bill, you are less concerned about the long-term survival of the human species. It's not really a thing, unless you are deeply, deeply traumatized, it's not really a thing that you think about every single waking second, and nor should it be. Do you think it's gonna catch us by surprise? Do you think we need to have a retraining of how we think about futures? Well, I, I rather suspect that this is quite an individual puzzle, that how you grapple with the uh, the magnitude of the questions that we face is very personal. And so, you know, I know how I do it, and I know how the people I know well do it, and I know how I navigated it in a classroom with students, and I know how Heather, my wife, who also taught at Evergreen, navigated it with students. And so those are all versions of this, but it may be that uh, there are other mechanisms that work better for other people and really the, the point is you need to know that you're looking for some way of simultaneously not letting your life in the present go to hell uh, as you're trying to grapple with these big existential questions um, and that at the end of the day you need to be okay with it you know if it's going to depress you to the point that you you can't get out of bed then that's obviously not viable so you have to find a mechanism Mine involves what I call the cosmic joke, which can be told 
I'm sure, an infinite number of ways. But when you realize what we are, and I mean, how preposterous it is that, you know, given what we are evolutionarily, that we're even here having a conversation about this question, it's pretty funny, right? The idea that, you know, the ooze is now beginning to worry about making the world a place that can't, can't uh, support us. So for me, it involves humor. For others, it may involve grief. And, you know, if I'm perfectly honest with, the, with you, maybe I went through some of that too, just recognizing that there's a way in which I still think the problem can be solved or I wouldn't be talking about it, but I do think there's a fair chance we won't. And um, somehow, you know, I have to be okay with the fact that it's worth taking a shot, but that at some level, um, if it doesn't get solved, uh, you know, I don't want to have to confront myself and say, did you not do enough? Were there other things you could have said, other people you could have talked to? I don't want to have that conversation. Um, but if I feel like I've, you know, I've, I've done my best to lay out the puzzle so other people can see it, we took a shot and it'll either work or it won't work. Um, but, uh, but it has to be okay to have, to have taken your best shot and then seen what happens. Can we talk a little bit about some of the potential bedtime stories about the future that were being sold to help us sleep at night? And those are the growth stories. There's a belief that, look, if we can't grow anymore on this planet, that the one way we're going to go is to the stars. And that's being sold quite heavily on West Coast areas of your country in the US. And also Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is being sold as an infinite growth potential. AI is the idea of an infinite growth of a workforce. Do you believe that these are gender-led narratives or do you think they could actually be the thing that allows us to have another boom? Um, did you say gender-led? Agenda. Got it. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I may you have, have very selective, yeah, selective, very selective for, for good reasons. American for hearing. good reasons. Yeah. All right. Um, they are, uh, let's Agenda. put it this way. Agenda led. Elon um, Musk and his buddies. Yeah. Right to... I don't know. My, I tend to think um, that they are more the result of very particular echo chambers than they are uh, designed to placate. So, I mean, I particularly find the one about us going to Mars um, a bit shocking because as much as I think it's tantalizing that human beings would get to Mars, um, I also know it's no place to live. I mean, even if you could make it technically habitable. But that's the promise of the geographical frontier as opposed to the transfer frontier, which is much more, much more terrifying. Um, yes, although... You know, you have to think about whether the particular piece of geography is a desirable one. You know, <laughs> Mars, I think, would be cool for two, three days. And then <laughs> there's nothing to see, right? Even all the rocks are the same color. So um, my feeling, and you know, on the flip side, it is always, until the moment that the Earth is no longer habitable, it is always going to be easier to fix this planet than it is to make that one function. So there's, I mean, I see zero hope, as, you know, for Mars as a sort of, you know, escape continent for, for the Earth. Right, but um, back, back to technological fronts here, the argument is if we work out how to terraform Mars, we'll work out how to fix this planet in the process. So let's continue that narrative for that reason. Good. Well, in, you know, in 400 years, we can have that conversation again. But for the moment, let's talk about the issue. You know, you mentioned Bitcoin, you mentioned AI. And I think we have, you know, again, we're talking about uh, symptoms of an unnamed problem. So in this, in this case, we've got a bunch of technologies. I think many of them do have great promise, but what they're, the context that they're being generated is one in which we have this um, mind-numbing economic paradigm, one that actually is in love with this insane model of growth. I mean, and it really is insane. So the example I, I like to use to point this out is, let's say that one of us invents a refrigerator and it would last 
10 times as long as your current refrigerator and in every other way be your current refrigerator's equal. That's economically bad, right? Because it's going to result in fewer refrigerators being sold, so it's going to result in a depression in growth. Surely our economic system should view that new refrigerator as a win, but it views it as a loss because our model uh, views economic health as the... the um, shift of useful kinds of energy into useless heat and the transition of useless raw materials into unrecoverable trash, right? That's what economic health is to us. We have to get over that, right? We have to rethink the whole thing. And if we did, if we rethought the economic model, and then we took some of these technologies seriously, you know, AI, Bitcoin, all the rest, it is possible, oh, fusion really ought to be on that list, it is quite possible that we could harness these things and we could make um, quite a good, uh, stable, safe, fair planet. Uh, if we don't, if we pursue all of these technologies uh, a la carte and we leave the economic model off the table, then each of these things are going to get subsumed into this um, very broken style of thinking that we've gotten used to. And I'm afraid even fusion, which might be the one technology, the, the silver bullet technology that'd be capable of fixing uh, the planet, uh, I don't want to say in one fell swoop, but a trajectory from the discovery of viable fusion uh, could lead us to, to a functional world. But if we actually allow fusion to come to maturity under our current models, I don't think that's what would happen at all. I think we would end up um, basically increasing uh, the power of a dangerous uh, political mode, and it would be it would be a disaster. But then the issue of relying on those sorts of systems and those sorts of economic models is currently they're very short term. I think, with the exception of what Jeff. Bezos has promised with regards to playing with the future or playing in the future to allow his stock price to be at a loss in the present. He's one of the very few who's managed to kind of engineer that model for himself, but it's not really the most efficient way to build futures. And I know you've argued that truly efficient markets need to get rid of what Google was talking about, which was the don't be evil paradox. And take a brand new approach to risk, which is let's throw the baby out with the bathwater and really drive this thing to the extremity to just see what happens. Do you think that's also a potential? Um, well, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a much bigger conversation, but the, what you pointed to in, in the beginning of your question is that there is a trade-off between how effectively you play in the short term and how you play in the long term, which is in fact why fusion energy has remained outside of reach to this point, is that it has not paid anybody yet to invest in it in the way we would have to invest in it to get there because you wouldn't necessarily live to see the monetary rewards that would come from it. So anyway, that would be a great place for some governance apparatus to have stepped in. Maybe the economic system has finally delivered us the technology that will do it. There are hints that that might be on the horizon. But in some sense, if you don't want people uh, playing their narrow self-interest uh, against our collective long-term well-being, then you have to make sure that it doesn't pay to do so. And uh, if you want us to invest in solutions for multi-generation problems, then you have to correct for the fact that uh, short-term will always win out in a perfectly free market. Short-term will always win out against very long-term um, because very long-term is basically a dry spell that you have to endure. So anybody who's playing for profits in the very short term uh, drives you extinct before your long-term wisdom shows itself to be accurate. If you, want, if you want us to behave differently, you have to be willing to structure the incentives so that they reward the kind of behavior that you want to see, which I know lots of people will hear as a, um, a very frightening idea. But I think it can be done actually relatively uh, humanely and with a light hand, so we don't end up uh, over meddling and uh, doing, you know, what the left frequently does, which is um, fail to appreciate the uh, the downsides of solution making. Um, so anyway, I'd, I would love to see us engage that question uh, at a society wide level, 
and do so seriously. So it's back to essentially retraining our thinking to be comfortable with getting short-term uh, short-term advantages to uh, sorry long-term advantages to some of the things that may be a massive risk in the short term, whether economically or environmentally or otherwise. Well, in a sense, what you want is uh, the good part of capitalism, where the market can train uh, can train a person to discover the path forward, but you want to correct for the bias in short term over long term or the tendency to create externalities as a way of generating profit. Um, so anyway, I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm a big fan of markets. I think markets are incredibly powerful, but they're powerful when they tell us how to do something. Markets can solve the how problem very effectively, but they should never be allowed to tell us what, right? We should tell markets what we want done and markets should tell us how to do it. And if you divide the thing that way, then the power of markets can be freed from the horror of them. Let's return just a little bit back to the human and back to evolution. The title of this talk is Harnessing Evolution and some of the Twitter conversation leading up to this event, some people were outraged by the idea that you wanted to harness evolution. I mean, that's just the nature of just the nature of Twitter. They were seeing what they wanted to see. But if we were to harness human evolution for the betterment of us as individuals, which sounds slightly problematic, in what ways could we do it? Should we take a r massive uh, high-risk approach to our own human biology to ensure our survival in the future because it feels like we're already taking that massive risk with our own human biology and and it's it's with the environments through which we bring children up so it's not even the educational environment it's the fact that half of the children in the US don't have the immune systems to survive the present we're living in because of the two most scariest words in advertising which are debt or protects <laughs> when you grow kids up in, in environments where 99.9% .9 of germs are removed they don't develop their own immune system and they lean on the economics of the American drug system to generate their immune systems do you think we are in a post-Darwinist age where essentially we are hurting ourselves. We are not evolving for a betterment of humanity. We're homogenizing the human to the extent that we're going to be reliant on technology to ensure our survival. Well, we're doing a lot of things. We are ignoring that the fact that we remain evolutionary creatures operating an evolutionary program that we haven't fully elucidated, so we don't even know what parts of it to be afraid of. At the same time, we're throwing huge amounts of novelty at our systems, which they are incapable of properly processing. So we're unhealthy physiologically, psychologically, and socially because we're living in an environment that we're not built for. So we're doing all of those things. Um, and from the point of view of, I was a little surprised that saying that we should harness evolution uh, or it will harness us caused people, I think, to hear, you know, uh, echoes of eugenics or something, which is really um, n not what I intended to imply at all. In fact, genes were nowhere on my mind when I when I wrote that phrase. What I was really talking about um, is properly understanding the importance of the cultural side of our, our evolutionary program and harnessing mechanisms that are capable of leveling us up. In other words, instead of haphazardly discovering what works, basically through a cultural Darwinian mechanism that involves a huge amount of carnage that we could intentionally use things like markets and analogs of markets to in increase the capacity of our minds to address the problems that we face. Whether we should do that in the service of evolution, it seems to me crystal clear that we mustn't. That this is the moment at which we have to take evolution out of the driver's seat because uh, this is probably going to sound wrong to most folks, but we actually know what our purpose is. Uh, our purpose is the exact same purpose as every other creature that has evolved on this planet and presumably any other that hasn't gone through such a transition. Your purpose is the same purpose as a spruce tree, a squid, 
a malaria particle, they all have the identical purpose, which means it's not a very interesting one. <laughs> so um, what we should do is recognize that that purpose has resulted in an amazing machine, that what we are, what we are capable of, is very special stuff. And what it is in service of is not special at all. So it is time for us to look at the purpose that we were handed and say, you know what? Not good enough. We, we are human beings and we are capable of a, a purpose worthy of the amazing machinery we've been handed. And we can write our own purpose. I don't want to pretend that that's easier than it actually is. There's one bitter pill that comes along with it, which is if you're going to write your own purpose, you have to do it in a way that it is game theoretically uh, immune to challenge from other individuals that don't accept a new purpose. In other words, were, were humans serious about rewriting their purpose and making the purpose of humanity worthy of, of what we are, it has to be what's called an evolutionarily stable strategy, which means a strategy that can endure competition from any other strategy that you might introduce. That's not possible, is it? That's not possible. By the nature of just being human beings, that is not possible. I believe it is possible. In what way? So some of the people who are trying to harness so some of the people who are trying to harness evolution are groups like transhumanists who believe that we're going to take the technological frontier and we're going to ignore the geographical frontier, the transfer frontier. We're going to take the technological frontier and we're going to run with that one. We're going to cryogenically freeze our bodies, upload our minds so that we can propagate as quickly as memes propagate. I mean, where do you stand on on these sorts of individuals who believe that is the potential new purpose for human beings? You know, there's, there's interesting stuff there, but I think it's largely uh, nonsense that in some sense, if you, you know, the uploading your mind business is a little bit uh, of a reinvention of the teleporter problem, right? The teleporter is kind of a cool idea. You step into the teleporter and you disintegrate here and you're reassembled over there. But if the teleporter didn't work and you were reassembled over there and you still existed over here, um, would you volunteer to step in to the teleporter to be disintegrated so that the one that was on the other end could then go on and continue to live your life? No, you probably wouldn't. So likewise, you know, if, if suddenly tomorrow somebody announces that we could, you know, credibly upload your mind to the cloud, um, and the only thing uh, is that you have to agree to have your physical manifestation destroyed, you know, after we've done the, the uploading, you're not going to be too thrilled with that either. So, um, so anyway, I would say the transhumanist stuff, you know, transhumanism is a label. I do believe we have to essentially transcend what we've been to this point. So maybe you could argue this is some version of transhumanism, but all of the versions of transhumanism that I've heard are, you know, they're cornucopian in their own way. And I don't think I have, I have yet to hear one that is a satisfying picture of some future. So I'm not arguing that rewriting our purpose will be easy and doing it in a way, I know if we don't do it in a way that is uh, evolutionarily stable, that it's more or less pointless, that we might stave off a problem for a generation or two, but that we would be returned to exactly the puzzle we're in now by evolutionary forces. So uh, I, I think it has to be done carefully. And, you know, what's more, you have to do it in a way that, evol that uh, avoids the other pitfall, which is um, the dystopian uh, scenarios that follow any sort of utopian plan. So I, we haven't talked about this yet, but uh, I have argued in several places that utopia is probably the worst idea human beings ever had. And so if you hear me as a utopian, you're not hearing me right yet. Um, we need to do this in a non-utopian way um, if it's to function at all. And we have to be very sensitive to doing it in a way that reveals if we are headed towards a, a dystopian outcome that we didn't anticipate, we have to see that coming so that we can save ourselves from that too. Let's talk about less of the technologies that will help us create this human purpose or this, this generalized purpose and talk more about the processes and very specifically the, the political processes that may allow this to occur because you've been a massive advocate of, of kind of confronting 
the distinction between the political left and the political right, you think that that's not very useful when it comes to having these sorts of discussions? Yeah, it's really quite useless. And um, what's more, I mean, the way I, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to solve the world's problems through the political apparatus that we have. And basically, they all came to naught. And I begin, I began to wonder why that was, why there was no plausible route out of our predicament. And what I came to realize was that actually nobody on the left or the right has a clue policy-wise what we're supposed to do. All of the things that are advocated on both sides are so feeble relative to the puzzles that they ostensibly are targeted at that really we are at a point where we have to admit that the, um, the toolkit we've been playing with just isn't, it's not powerful enough to deal with what we're up against. Now that's bad on the one hand because it means we don't have the tools yet. But it's good in another way because it means that when you sit down with somebody who is, you know, if you're on the left and you're sitting down with people on the right or vice versa, acknowledging that none of us have the right answers in terms of what we're supposed to do actually allows a whole different conversation to unfold where we talk about what unites us. And there's, I think, a surprising amount that does unite people on the political left and the political right. Um, and is the basis of a new conversation. And really, you know, people are generally, whether left or right, agreed that um, structural biases against certain people are bad, right? That it would be a desirable thing if we had a world in which there was no structural bias that came from who you, who you were born as. And, you know, there would then be inequality based on what you did with what you were handed. But the that basically fairness is desirable. What we differ over is how likely we are, you know, how unfair things are in the present and how likely we are to be able to make them more fair without doing damage. Left and right are divided over that. But as soon as you put the policy question aside and you say, let's first just agree on what we would like the world to look like, um, the basis for uh, a fertile discussion is there. And that discussion isn't happening. We're too divided over policy. But I would I would suggest um, recognizing the failure of our our whole landscape of policy proposals, so that you can move forward from values. And then the question is, all right, if these are our values, if these are the things that we want to see, what are the policies that actually might lead us there? And uh, I suspect the policy, the level of uh, change necessary at a policy level is great that we need to actually architect systems that nobody's envisioned yet, but, uh, but that doing so is plausible and that we could realize the values that unite us at a much higher level than our present system does. So do you think the issue is the, the policies are generated to get to a degree to affect change, but also to get elected? Again, it's back to the short-termism and long-termism and how those two things basically do not interplay. So you can you very rarely hear the values of most left or right politicians because they're so fragmented by social media biases anyway, but the policies are even harder to grasp because they have to speak specifically to you who's going to be the voting electorate. Do you think there needs to be something maybe even outside of politics where science can maybe lead a new progressive way in which we think and operate in the world? So... Uh, I think what you've said is quite accurate, that there's something about the political dynamic that is inherently unpatriotic. And I don't necessarily mean patriotism with respect to any particular nation, but unpatriotic relative to the values that should unite us. So the because politics has to be uh, self-perpetuating, because you have to get the votes in order to wield the power, it does cause policy to be warped into a, um, a vote generating scheme rather than a values realization mechanism. So the question really is, in light of the jeopardy that we face together, is there not a patriotic politics? And, you know, it's a little bit before my time, actually, but there was a tradition of the loyal opposition the idea that just because somebody disagreed with you on policy didn't mean that they were your antagonist, right? They were, you were in a real disagreement over the way to accomplish shared goals. 
And so we need to find our way back to that modality where we don't suspect everybody who disagrees with us of some kind of deep moral failing, because in general, that's not what's going on. In general, we're proceeding from such a different set of priors that we reach a different conclusion that sounds like subterfuge of some kind. But if you started with their priors, you'd find out why they end up there. On that note, I want to open this out to the audience. So we have an audience mic. Please wait for the mic because we're recording this um, for distribution. And I just want to go to this question, just gentlemen here. Hi, Brad. Um, Tom, we met earlier <laughs> briefly at the Hi, bar. Hi, Tom. Um, I was just wondering, um, it resonated a lot what you said about, you know, basically we're standing in our own way with the way that we're thinking and uh, being kind of growth machines uh, as we are and just looking out to reproduce and <laughs> that, that's not helpful. Um, I'm just thinking myself, I find it really, really hard to find that third way of thinking. So not being hopeful and not being fearful because I think both might be kind of wrong because actually I'm still standing in my own way. I have a physical body, I want to survive. I might even want to, you know, just generate more babies and whatever. Um, you know, how do I get out of that way of thinking? Well, again, that's gonna be really a personal question, but at some level, you know, I don't know, if I were to start with that question, I would say, well, here's the bad news. You are going to die, right? <laughs> could be sooner, could be later, um, but at some level, the clock is ticking. And I think culturally speaking, we in the West work very hard not to have to think about that. But if we tune into it and we realize that actually it has implications and the question isn't how do I avoid dying? It's what do I do with the time I have left? Uh, you could get pretty excited about, you know, the fact that the next few decades might be a, a time in which, you know, it might be a time that people are still talking about a thousand years from now, if there are people to do any talking at all. If there are, they might look back on this and say, yeah, that was a pretty close call for humanity, but aren't we glad that they bootstrapped these new mechanisms? So anyway, I would think that that's, uh, I don't know if we do live in an era, uh, I rather think if, if we don't live in an era in which we bootstrap the new mechanisms, then there won't be people here a thousand years from now to talk about it. But if there are, then our having been here at this moment is kind of an honor, right? And it's also uh, a really interesting set of puzzles to be faced with. So maybe if I were in your shoes, I would say getting excited about the puzzle might be the way to go. Any other questions at all? Just here. Uh, hi, Brent. Thank you for coming. Interesting talk. Uh, my name is Melania. We met before. Um, thinking about the rise in populism, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, what is it about the populist discourse that is so effective? Well, so let, let's talk about what happened in the U.S. in our last election, because I think it tells a very clear story, but it's one I haven't really heard said out loud. So we had two insurgencies. We had one on the political left with Bernie Sanders and one on the political right with Donald Trump. The Democrats took care of their insurgency. They got rid of it. That left one insurgency on the map. And what isn't said very frequently about what happened in the US is that a large number of people, it wasn't, uh, it was enough probably to sway the election or at least to contribute substantially to Trump's victory, switched from Sanders to Trump, which is politically incoherent if you look at what these people represent. But if your real point was, I'm so frustrated with what the system is delivering that I'm going to vote against the system, and you can't vote against the system with Sanders in the general election because he's endorsed Clinton, so now you're going to vote against the system by voting for Donald Trump, that that tells you really where we are in history, right? It is finally to the point where people are angry enough about the corruption and the dysfunction to confront the system. So I actually find that quite hopeful. On the other hand, what we did didn't make any sense. So, uh, and you know, it's put us all in, in, uh, in a substantial amount of danger. But 
I would say the key part of the thing to pay attention to is that that frustration is still there and harnessing it to a useful purpose would be uh, a very wise thing to do. Um, hello, my name is Daniel. So there's a great amount of fantastic intellectuals out there who we can reach through podcasts and YouTube. And there are a few topics that pops up every time. So like AI, global warming, um, the political problems. Uh, and the strange thing that each of these intellectuals think that education is extremely important, but probably this is the first time when I heard a few sentences about education. And what I want to ask is that why do you think it's not a topic out there talking about the reform of education uh, just like any other topics? That's a really interesting question. I think there are a couple things going on. Uh, I know that while Heather and I were teaching at Evergreen, there was a certain lack of interest in talking about what might be wrong with the educational apparatus if you thought that the apparatus was itself quite broken. And there was a way in which it, it looked like it came down to the fact that people who were the product of that system weren't very interested in recognizing it as a failure because to recognize it as a failure is to recognize themselves as um, not capable. So I, I don't have any problem recognizing that the system that produced me is falling short, but a lot of people do. So there's, I think there's just an emotional bias against it. But I also think in some ways it's a mirror for the situation that we're in in terms of governance, which is, so we have a metaphor that we use in evolutionary biology, which I find very useful. And it's called the adaptive landscape. And basically one needs to think about opportunities as peaks on the adaptive landscape and obstacles to getting to an opportunity as valleys. So you have to go from a low peak through a valley to get to a high peak. And the problem is that if you think about the height on the adaptive landscape as a measure of how good things are, well, if you're on a low peak and you have to go into the valley, things get worse before they get better. So what would you have to do to make the educational system work? Well, it's an awfully deep valley with a very beautiful peak on the other side that I think we can't quite see. So people, I think, are troubled by the gap, and that gap if you can't imagine what's on the other side, then the gap looks very frightening. I mean, maybe it's just a bottomless pit. So we're in that same puzzle politically because you have to abandon the idea that the policy proposals of the moment contain any sort of important solution before you can be free enough to start thinking about, well, how many systems are there that actually could solve our problems and what might they look like and what are the dangers if you set one in motion? So the size of the gap is is actually there's a, I think the way to say it is there's an interaction between the Overton window, which is that which you are capable of conceptualizing, and the size of that gap. And if your Overton window isn't big enough to encompass what's on the other side, you shy away from that puzzle. So um, broadening the Overton window might be the way to get there, or properly painting a picture that has enough reality to it that people can begin to imagine, you know, what's on the other side. Thanks a lot, Brett. That was very interesting and a little unexpected, actually. So um, I want to bring in the issue of, um, of humor and also um, precedence for thinking about our being in a sort of uh, species level existential risk. So going back to the Cold War, and I want to raise the, uh, the specter of Herman Kahn, Dr. Strangelove, the model for Dr. Strangelove. And he had a certain kind of way, what he called, um, you know, thinking the unthinkable. And so the idea was, and in a way it challenges something that, that you seem to assume in your talk, because when you talk about the existential risk facing humanity, you keep on using this word we, uh, as if all of us are going to either survive or die. But in, as a matter of fact, 
uh, it's more likely that given the kinds of existential risks that we're likely to face, that it'll take out a certain percentage of the human population, but not all of it. And, it'll, and it probably will take out a significant amount of the infrastructure and the culture and so forth that maintains the human population, but not all of it. And so the point then becomes, and this is where you start to think about the future, is what sorts of technologies and things, what sorts of cultural arrangements will you need, assuming that we will indeed end up having to go through a very deep valley, to use what your metaphor just now, right, in the sense that we are going to actually hit the bottom. We're going to have the existential risk, but it's not going to take out everyone. It'll take out maybe 30%, 40%, maybe 70%. But let's say there's still 30% around, and let's say it's n the planet is not totally destroyed, and you pick your catastrophe, okay? They were talking about nuclear uh, exchange, of course, but we have a lot of catastrophes to choose from these days. Um, and so part of this in the Cold War motivated a lot of, as it were, after doomsday technologies, one of which was the internet, right? Because the internet was created on the assumption that if there was a nuclear exchange, the telephone lines would be taken out and you'd need some other way of mass communication. Now, of course, we never had this kind of mutual uh, nuclear exchange that would end the world in that kind of fashion. But nevertheless, we benefited from the technology as a result once the Cold War was over. So uh, from the standpoint of rationality right now, right, uh, is there not something for, to, to be said for this strategy that I've just laid out for you? Yeah. Um, so a couple things. One, uh, there is a, I don't know that it has a name, but there is a process um, whereby something that has brought you to a certain place becomes an existential threat to you. And so these are things we're very poorly prepared for because the very thing that has worked to get us here is now the thing we must get over without discovering it as an existential failure. I think this is where we are. So I can't say for sure that uh, we couldn't have a major collapse that would wipe out some large fraction of the population of the globe and leave some other fraction. But I also have the sense that that is in a way a fairy tale that serves a certain mode that used to work. So there's a way in which um, populations collapsing leaves more well-being for those who are left behind. So if you are in a position to survive a collapse better than somebody else, you may actually want it because it sort of purges some fraction of the population whose wealth or opportunity you can then take advantage of. So it's a kind of cryptic transfer. And I'm afraid that that game has worked so well so many times that we are now uh, dealing with people who are triggered to think, ah, we are there again, whether they know consciously that that's what they're thinking or not. But when I look at the, uh, one struggles for words, but I mean the perfectly insane way that we've hooked up the 400 civilian nuclear reactors that exist on the planet so that they require absolutely constant vigilance to keep not only the cores of the reactors cool, but these vast fuel pools Right? We have behaved so stupidly, and the amount of money that it would take to just reduce that problem to a third of its present size is small, and yet we don't do it. So I know we're lying to ourselves. Um, you could make the same argument relative to uh, Carrington events and the vulnerability of our transformers to a solar storm. Right, the, It would cost apparently something like the price of a single B-2 bomber to fix the entire North American grid and make it immune to a Carrington event. Um, so in essence, so little money that nobody needs to suffer any sort of privation of any kind in order to address it. And yet we endure some large risk every decade that a storm is going to come out of nowhere and knock out half the grid of North America and leave it offline for six months with who knows how many nuclear reactors suddenly dependent on the constant delivery of diesel fuel. So I can tell we're behaving stupidly because there are problems that would be very cheap to solve that are very, very dangerous that we don't solve. Um, all of those reactors spilling their contents at once would be very bad. Is it impossible for humans to survive that? I don't know, but it would make a much lesser world. So I know anybody who's playing this strategy because they think they're going to inherit the world with fewer people on it is making an error because the world they're going to inherit isn't going to be a very nice place. So I would say whether or not 
existential threat is really all of us the way I think it is, or it isn't really all of us, but the world will be toxified in a way that it won't be detoxified for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, it makes sense for us to behave as a united entity that faces a bottleneck that we have to get through together or not at all. There's something about New Zealand that everybody knows about that some of us don't. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps as well. <laughs> There's very few nuclear reactors. Um, hopefully your brother might know something about that. Um, Pat Kane. Hi, uh, Pat Kane from Future First. I want to ask you a question about epistemic diversity. Uh, lock the doors. <laughs> uh, it, the Chinese leadership described themselves as uh, wanting to bring about an ecological civilization. That's their stated aim. Uh, they're, they're invoking Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism, and they're building a social rating system out of algorithms and the internet so that people can get themselves in balance with each other, i.e. reduce their desirous egotism and fit themselves to the social bond. You know, mindfulness is raging across the West as a way for us to deal with our Cartesian dualism, non-dualism versus, funny enough, versus dualism. To what extent is your evolutionary framework actually a very Western defined evolutionary framework? You're dealing with the kind of the, 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 the polarization of the opposites as maybe George Peterson would talk about. And isn't there a question of epistemic diversity? Aren't, isn't one of the things about being evolutionarily human is that we are creative but the extent of our creativity is that we can actually define epistemology and ontology, truth and reality, in wildly different ways. And aren't you coming from quite a narrow Western position? Uh, yes and no. You know, my way of thinking comes at the end of a trajectory, right? So Darwin had to do what he did in order for the people in the generation ahead of me to learn what they did about evolution in order for me to go where I've gone with it. But at the end of the day, all true models of the universe must reconcile. So I can't say how my viewpoint would be different if it had arisen in you know, an Eastern tradition. What I can say is it's either wrong or it will reconcile with whatever would come about through that alternative path. And so I'm not too worried about it, right? In other words, the reason that I believe what I believe is that the model makes predictions and those predictions match what I see in the world. And if the model was way off, that wouldn't be the case. So what I would love is to discover that you're right and that this trajectory exists in other traditions. And I would like to see those traditions emerge and then compare notes because no doubt um, there are biases in the form of you know, emphasis. There are things that, you know, I find uh, central that may be uh, underemphasized mm -hmm. in another version. And likewise, there would be things from some other version of this story that I don't see as important enough. So I would love to compare notes with other people who had reached parallel conclusions, or if they'd reached conclusions that were inconsistent with what I think is true, I'd love to hear about that too, because uh, either uh, I'm right, and I've got some teaching to do, or I'm wrong, and I've got some learning to do, but either way, it's productive. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to finding those other modes, but in the meantime, I'm not going to worry too much that uh, it's wrong because it doesn't come from some other tradition. I've, I've got the tools I've got, and they've led me where I am. Two more questions. Just here, Gunnar Taylor. Hello. Hey, Luke, thanks. Hi, Brett. My name is Ganesh. I have a really quick question for you. So it seems to me that what you're describing is that you want humans to have a conversation about what our purpose is as humankind, right? Um, I'm a human being, I'm an individual, and I'm asking myself that question just in my own head, right? And I don't quite know how long that's going to take me to find an answer beyond I need to reproduce. Um, so my question is really simple. If it might take me some time to do that, how long do you think it's going to take for all of us to have those conversations with ourselves and then with other people? Uh, a good and very subtle point. But I would argue that one of the things that we do not properly appreciate about the very unique sort of creature that we are is that we do an awful lot of thinking in our heads, um, our 
to, to each of us, self is a very compelling entity because we have contact with it in a way we don't have contact even with people who we're very close with who don't happen to be self. On the other hand, much of what we understand about what is true, we generate in dialogue with other people that share enough with us for their thoughts to be provocative to us and our thoughts to be provocative to them. So I really am literally talking about us talking to each other about useful purpose. And I will say, having done this now with many rooms full of students, I think the conversation is more straightforward than I think you think. Um, in other words, there aren't that many purposes that can be defended. And once you get in the neighborhood of those purposes that can be defended, it's really a question of precision beyond what we need. Because really what we need is a mechanism to get us through the bottleneck mm -hmm. to figure out how to stabilize the way we interact so that we are not constantly generating new threats to humanity. And having done that, um, it leaves people free to disagree about abstractions like, well, what is our purpose? Time for one more question just here. Hi, Brett. I'm Lucy. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I was more interested in going back to a point that you touched on about comedy and the actual ability to even have these conversations in an open, free-thinking way. Um, there's been a lot of talk, or I've read quite a few articles saying that what happened to you and your wife at Evergreen was sort of an outlier. And I was wondering if you could expand on, even if it was an outlier in its sort of severity and extremity, how much, how much of it is it a symptom of a much larger problem on campuses in the US? And as a follow-up, I was wondering if you have any knowledge of what it's like elsewhere. Have any UK academics reached out to you? And if so, what have they been telling you about what it's like here? Uh, yeah, that's a, an interesting set of questions. I do think Evergreen was an outlier in one sense. I mean, it was, I don't know whether this audience saw what took place, but it was spectacular and absurd <laughs> in a way that's going to be hard for anybody to top for a little while. It's gonna take some creativity. On the other hand, uh, it was a version of something that is utterly generic. So Heather and I have been involved in many conversations since last May about the state of the world and uh, what to do about it. And it is actually rare to have a conference where you don't have some version of this show itself, often incoherently in the context of what's being discussed. So. Yes, there is at the moment, uh, I find it a rather absurd hunger to hear that the problem is really much smaller than people think. And yes, there are excesses and we've seen them on YouTube, but no, it's not threatening the academy. Yes, it is threatening the academy. It is, um, it is like a social lobotomy, right? The concepts that people just cannot entertain are so many that basically it hobbles the thinking of of the, of the entity itself. And on the one hand, I find it very odd to be in the position of defending the academy because when I was employed within the academy, I was not a fan of how it functioned. Um, on the other hand, I now find the idea that we are going to confront enlightenment values of all things um, absurd. And even, you know, it's not even enlightenment values. It's they're literally confronting the idea of enlightenment. They're challenging it with the notion that there is only power and there is not truth. And therefore, all arguments that claim to have detected some truth are really cryptic arguments designed to wield power. That's such a dangerous kind of sophistry that we have to get over it, right? And we have to show students how to get over it so that they are not detained for their entire lives with this wrong way of th seeing things. I think what's going on in the UK, if I understand it correctly, is not as severe as what's going on in the US, but the way we're all linked together, right? The academy isn't a bunch of 
you know, it's not even really a bunch of different schools. The schools are linked together through disciplines, right? It's linked together through publications. And those linkages mean that to the extent that some set of concepts becomes forbidden in some quadrant, that that spreads in some way the rest of us can't detect. But um, the problem really couldn't be more dangerous from the point of view of the threat it represents to the academy. But by virtue of the role that the academy is supposed to play in civilization, it's actually, if all we lost was the academy, I think that would be a win. We can rebuild the academy. Um, but what we can't afford to do is descend into madness for the next 20 years because it's become fashionable to think there's no such thing as reality. Um, we have to confront that and uh, properly disarm it so that we can get back to the difficult business of figuring out what's true and what to do about it. And Brett, I think my final question is a follow on from that. We've seen, we've seen the new atheists, and I'd argue that people like yourself and people like Jordan Peterson fall into a new category who's dealing with the fact that God is dead, which are the new progressives. And people like yourself who are evolutionary biologists who understand certain scientific facts about the ways in which humans operate and then have to come into conflict with folks who argue identity politics, who hold sometimes rather mythic notions of identity. And really my closing question is, how do we as individuals and how do you be a, a effective progressive in the 21st century? What does it mean to be a new progressive? So the distinction that I'm going to draw might be a little hard for people to, to follow, but there are cryptically among us two sorts of folks. Because of the way well-being is acquired in life, it is perfectly possible to be dead wrong about the nature of the universe and do well within it because of the role that the social architecture plays in allocating rewards. So the problem is that being dead wrong and getting ahead by being dead wrong causes wrong ideas to appear quite right. What is going on with uh, the new voices that I think, I think you are correctly defining them as progressive, even though some of them are right of center, those new progressive voices seem without exception, to be people who are operating from first principles. And the, the hallmark of a first principles thinker is that they are unpersuaded by a mob, right? It doesn't matter that you're the only person in the room that believes something to be true. That is immaterial with respect to whether it actually is true. And so fundamental thinkers are being actually identified and targeted by uh, this illiberal movement in part because they are the people who will be unpersuaded by threat. So what I would argue is that all of us need to tap into this distinction and we need to start following first principles where they lead, even when they lead us to frightening conclusions, right? That's the, that's the, the, the part that's difficult for people is that there's no guarantee if you do follow first principles that you will find out that everything's going to be okay because maybe it won't. Um, but the only hope we have of fixing the problems that we face is to confront what they actually are and to be um, careful in our critical thinking about what causes them and what other routes are available to us. So in essence, we just don't have any choice. First principles are where it's at and you're either a first principles thinker or um, we need to be careful about what you're trying to tell us. So on that note, embrace the first principles. And I want to say a couple of thanks. Uh, the first is a thank you to Juju Bar and Stage for hosting us. And a massive thanks to Juliet, to our wonderful sound guy, Ivor, who's a character in his own right, and the incredible uh, bar staff. Uh, I think they deserve a round of applause.
And I also want to say a massive thank you to Matthew Barrell, who's been part of the Virtual Futures process for at least five years now, to Ricea, who was running the microphone, and to Adriel, who's running between cameras constantly. Um, because of these individuals, it means that, there you are, it means that we're able to make all of our content freely available online under Creative Commons. You can find more about Virtual Futures or at Virtual Futures pretty much anywhere online. And because this is Virtual Futures, I have to end with a warning. And it is the warning that we give at the end of every single Virtual Futures, which is the fact that the future is always virtual. And some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future isn't predicated on our capacity for prediction, although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. The bar is now open. Please join me in thanking the incredible Brett Weinstein. Thank you.